Another change, and probably even a bigger change, has been cremation. Uh, not something that was around much 20 and 30 and 40 years ago, and now you know they talk about the number of people getting cremated. Well, 50% and in some places 60 and 70%. So it's really changed dramatically. Bill Kwanbeck from Zumbro is going to talk a little bit about cremation. Is it an okay thing? Is it something that we as Christians should do and participate in with good confidence and courage? And so let's welcome Phil and look forward to his words. Thanks, Vern. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Yeah, I, I spoke on heaven, hell, and the end of the world last spring, and I think that's what brought me here. Uh, I, I do teach a course because few people talk about uh, death and afterlife and religion and Christianity. Uh, Vern asked me to start this segment by uh, uh, singing with you, Den Store wieder Flock. <laughs> Just testing to see who knows what that means. Often requested him when I served a country church in western Minnesota. I sat down yesterday with my father, uh, who's in a nursing home, uh, because of uh, hip fractures and and we talked about his funeral. And uh, they've decided on a columbarium at Central Lutheran Church in Minneapolis because any ELCA pastor or predecessor church body can qualify to purchase a columbarium space there. And uh, they will have their ashes interred there. And my mother's ashes will go in part, he thought, to the farm in North Dakota where she grew up. And he'd like his spread along the shoreline of Lake Vermilion in northern Minnesota. I just thought I'd let you know we've talked about that. And that's okay. I have a sheet on the uh, table in front of you, and uh, I thought I'd walk through some thinking uh, on cremation, give a little background and depth to the discussion. Uh, Genesis 3.19, dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Notice that's embedded already at the beginning of the story, the biblical story. Uh, those of you who grew up in farms were more, much more aware of living and dying. You'd see animals die and you'd see the remains rotting. Uh, I, I don't mean that in a gruesome way. I mean uh, you were close to it and you knew that uh, bodies returned to the ground. Uh, and if you grew up with a small church, uh, country church, like I served for several years, you'd walk past the few, uh, a cemetery on your way into church. Rarely happens anymore. But you had a different awareness. I remember walking in and seeing, when I first started pastoring there, uh, Margaret's name was there and her birth date was there and no death date. And then I realized she was the organist and she was just getting... <laughs> and she wanted to make sure she had her spot. <laughs> there are varieties of way of dealing with the body upon death in our religion and world religions. The ancient Egyptians were famous for the mummification of the pharaohs, the evisceration and desiccation of the body and preservation with wrapping, you all know that. Uh, Hinduism and Japanese religions often uh, uh, use funeral pyres in a respectful way to burn the bodies. Orthodox Judaism, and I mean Orthodox here, insisted on the burial of the unembalmed body within 24 hours. Now, one of the challenges to Judaism then became uh, after the Holocaust, when you had six million Jews who were literally incinerated to ashes. And so some theological reflection had to come upon that. And I don't mean to be morbid, but that's part of the reality. The word Holocaust, by the way, is from the Greek translation of the book of Leviticus, and it means a whole burnt offering. And so that is actually a religious term uh, applied to that event. And that was one way of dealing with those deaths where the bodies were not retrievable. Islam prohibits cremation, or it has, but on the other hand, Allah is not constrained. So who are we to say that, the, and they do believe in a kind of afterlife, resurrection, and Allah, uh, if Allah chooses, can resurrect even if there are only ashes. So even Islam allows for some provision there. Let's talk about the early, I'm going to go through quickly, maybe leave a little time for questions. Greco-Roman ideas of the material and the immaterial have certainly implanted themselves in our Christian thought. The Platonic concept of the body is a prison for the soul. You've heard that one, haven't you? 
Uh, the notion of an eternal immaterial soul which is released from the body. How many of you have actually heard that spoken about in Christian churches? It is not a Christian idea. You know that? That always shocks people and will leave you disturbed the rest of the day. <laughs> the problem with that is there is no need for a bodily resurrection if you already have an immaterial and eternal soul. Who needs a body? And that's exactly the problem Paul confronts in 1 Corinthians 15 when he says some of you, he's talking to Christians, see no need for the resurrection of the dead. The New Testament affirms, in contrast, an embodied life. 2 Corinthians 5, you know, talking about our earthly tent, and 1 Corinthians 15. Our bodies are part of who we are. To say, look at an body and say we're not there is really not true. Our bodies are tied to our spirits. And that's one of the challenges, I think, of biblical thinking, or at least the way I read it. There's been a historical Christian suspicion of cremation, and I think we've all inherited the practice seen pagan. And Western Christianity, that is Western Catholic Christianity, ceased cremation in the 4th century when Constantine became emperor. You all remember Constantine. See me later if you don't. <laughs> But the, the question is, what about the resurrection of the body? Does God need something to work with to resurrect you? Do you need a fragment of bone, a fleck of skin, a piece of hair? And notice how they took saints and <coughs> took them apart and spread their parts all over the way. Uh, we won't go into that. Uh, <laughs> Luther used to joke there were 12 apostles and 40 of them are buried in Germany. <laughs> The Catholic Church for a long time forbade cremation, but as I know here, has revised canon law in recent years. Not that that affects us, but I just want you to be aware uh, that cremated remains, uh, one may be cremated if one chooses, but the cremation needs to be done in a respectful way, and the bodies re uh, interred, or the remains interred in a grave or columbarium. Just as an aside, speaking of Western Catholicism, my wife, Ruth, who is stuck in Orlando due to something called a hurricane, uh, texted me in that Sister Generos died last night. She was 97, and I know she is a giant figure in this community. And so I just share that as news. But I think in some ways it's good news. Uh, sad news, but good news, right? The gospel can be proclaimed in that, and I'm sure it will be. Lutheran practice does not mandate a particular form of burial, and cremation is an option. If you go to the ELCA website, there's actually a page that says that. And again, the Lutheran emphasis would be on the respect for the handling of the body. And here's where I would talk about one thing about creation might be what we call the chain of possession. I think one concern sometimes is that bodies are shipped off to some remote place in an industrial park and, and burned there. Uh, but I, I think there are funeral homes and cremation services that do a respectful chain of possession so that the bodies are handled respectfully. Yes? Can I ask a quick, a quick question? A quick question. Um, what about uh, donating your body? Donating your body is a very good thing. A part of your body. Yeah, um, let me... Uh, okay, I'm uh, sorry. Uh, I'll, no, that's a, uh, the question has to do, what about donating the body or a part of your body? Um, and uh, I'll get to that in the next paragraph. I think that's a really significant question. So let me just go through, uh, and that also has to do with respectful handling right. of the body. Uh, we know people who've donated kidneys, right? Or upon death have donated uh, corneas. Or maybe in certain occasions, uh, if you die... Uh, have a brain death, but your body is still viable, you can donate your heart or other living organs. And we certainly uh, respect that in the Lutheran tradition. That, that kind of comes under this category. Uh, bringing modern science to bear. Decay, I think, is an oxidation of organic matter, and cremation is a hastened oxidation. I know I'm not a scientist, but I know people who are. <laughs> 
And we can't control the manner, place, and situation of our deaths. You know, let's say we were to meet I'm, a fiery death somewhere and our body is eliminated. Does that prevent us from being raised to life with God? And the answer would be no, I don't think. Um, we are part of an environment, and we have to think from a larger sense. We are part of this world. And what impact does our death have on this world? Um, in organ donation, in various ways, our bodies die and thrive. Parts of our bodies may die before what we consider ourselves to be, you know, if, if you have something removed. Uh, some parts of our bodies may live after us uh, if we don't, uh, if we donate organs, you know, if you think about that. So the, the notion of what is our body has really become a much more complex notion than anybody in the New Testament world knew. A wonderful example is the book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Anybody read that? About a woman who died in the early 50s, but whose uh, cells are still used today for scientific research, the HeLa cell. Uh, I just raise that to complicate your day. and uh, <laughs> So I will just then go to my, I draw a biblical perspective. Vern brought up a wonderful verse, whether we live to the Lord, die to the, we are the Lord's. I think coming at our bodies, our lives, from a theological perspective, that if God is in charge, that gives us a huge amount of freedom, and our responsibility then is to, as we've talked, Pastor Miller said, to manage our lives in a respectful way and to manage the lives of others and their bodies in a respectful way. And I think cremation may be actually a responsible and respectful way in our context to deal with our, our bodies and the bodies of others as we seek to preserve our environment, our memories, but also know that uh, um, that's part of our gospel freedom that we can do that. So I mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15 the complexity Paul says that we are raised with a new body. You know, I don't think God needs um, a whole organ of my body in order to get the genetics so he can reconstruct it. I, I think we, uh, from, if we think of God's perspective, uh, I think that's a liberating notion when it comes to cremation, burial, and how we deal with our, our bodies as we die. I think I'll stop there. I've run almost, to, what, 12 minutes at this point. Um, pretty quick, but questions, comments. I was speak your question about organs. I, I just want to make sure it's going to be okay with God. <laughs> it's okay with God if you donate your organs. Um, uh, there's a wonderful film called Jesus of Montreal, where the central figure, his life is continued in a variety of organ donations. Jason maybe saw it in class one day. I still use it. Um, so I think organ donation, blood donation, um, in our tradition, is all part of the recognition that our bodies can serve the world and others in a variety of ways. So I, yeah. So you'd want to make sure that your care provider knew you were going to do this, and this is something. I just wonder how it all works. Uh, how does it all work? I think it's something to let. Uh, Others know, maybe Vern has a place to talk about this this morning, but well, certainly your Minnesota driver's license. Yeah. Uh, and talk to others. Uh, again, I've had a, I know what my dad can see, I know we've had a conversation and we've had that conversation before. I know what his hopes are and what we are free to do. I know some people have just given the whole body. Oh, we know many, and every doctor in training here has to deal with someone's donated body. And I think you'll also find that they have a respectful interment for the bodies that have been used for medical training. And uh, or so my wife Ruth, who did her work at Mayo Medical School, uh, said that you know it was done in a very respectful way. They are not glib about the bodies that they use for training. That'd be fair to say no. Yeah, I have an illustration that it's the truth. Okay. That's a true statement. Um, uh, so I, I think those, uh, Dr. Noel Peterson, there are probably other doctors here who can attest to that. So that's my understanding. There is a lot of respect in that whole process. Someone who wasn't as respectful as he could have been was thrown out of medical school. Okay. Someone who wasn't respectful as he could have been was thrown out of medical school in Dr. Peterson's memory. So I, I just, we don't often hear about that, but I, I think... Uh, 
It's good to know. Other questions? How many of you have thought about cremation? Wow. I am too. That's what my wife and I have decided. And I think that's a wonderful... So I hope you feel reassured in that. And I, and I think uh, it, it's a rob obviously gaining in... Um, I hate to use the word popularity, but uh, uh, use and practice. And uh, I think we have a real gospel freedom and maybe an earthly responsibility. Any other thoughts, Vern? What uh, was it that prompted the church to back off of that in the so-called fourth, fourth century? Um, Roman and Greek practice had been to burn bodies, and I think the early church, uh, the question was what prom uh, prompted the church to uh, back away. I think the complexities of the notion of a resurrected body and the thought you need something to have be resurrected, um, and also a reaction to Greco-Roman practice where the burning of bodies uh, was not total, but, but a, a regular practice. And I think it's an inheritance from uh, a kind of late Judaism of that period, where the emphasis was on uh, burial of the body. And, and avoiding, it was seen as pagan practice in reaction to that. But then you have the problem of Christian martyrs who were burned at the stake, and, uh, and so you, had, you always then had to start building up exceptions. So what about the martyrs who were burned? Well, yeah, you know, then, so you kind of work back from the exceptions and realize what you're, uh, I guess the word I would use is the uh, deeper logic of the gospel. I got that from uh, a book by a man named Leander Keck, who taught at Yale, The Deeper Logic of the Gospel. And also in the, the Narnia stories, there is the deeper magic, isn't there? At the table where Aslan is sacrificed, there's something deeper at work. And I think that's what uh, we talk about, God's grace at work in matters of life and death. Wow. Um, feel like we should sing a song to raise the mood, but... Uh... <laughs>